Okay, well, um, welcome, good evening. Uh, first, before we begin, for any of you, uh, on G all of you on GB311, um, if you, uh, certainly after the last, um, after last week, if you're concerned about any um, gap between the lecture and the original course guide and um, the uh, reading list, follow the course guide and the reading list as well. I mean, in particular, if that makes sense. Any of you have any concern, come and see me. But just to make that absolutely clear. But I'll, I'll say a bit more about that uh, perhaps next week. Anyway, um, this evening we're going to hear about Scotland. We've heard about Scotland before in the context of the Constitution and also uh, in the context of uh, sub-national government and devolution when I was speaking a few weeks ago. Um, this week we're going to hear from Professor Jim Gallagher, uh, who has been not only an academic, uh, but also a practitioner in government. And uh, within the last six months, uh, was closely involved, uh, well, involved in the sense that everybody living in Scotland was, in the epic event that was the uh, Scottish referendum. So we'll have the usual um, procedure. We'll hear from Prof Professor Gallagher for perhaps uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, and then take questions. Jim. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, uh, it's nice to be back in the... Uh, LSE. Uh, it's one of those introductions which begins by saying, don't pay a blind bit of notice to what the lecturer has to say. Uh, the course guide uh, will give you all the truth. Well, uh, you can decide for yourselves afterwards. Um, it's more than a year uh, since I uh, last gave a talk to this course, and it's been quite a year. Uh, the UK, as a nation state, has been through what I might call a near-death experience. It almost decided, or it was almost decided for it, uh, that it would not continue uh, in its present form. But in the event, uh, it has continued in its present form, but a lot of other stuff has happened as well. We're four months, just over, uh, away from the referendum date, uh, and we're four months, just under, uh, away from the general election. And it's the most uncertain general election that most of us can remember. Certainly even old characters like Tony and me can't remember elections quite uh, as complicated as this one. And interestingly, the territorial issues, notably in relation to Scotland, could, and I say only could, uh, play a significant role in the post-election process. So what I'd like to do for the next 50 minutes or so is discuss how all of this came about. I want to talk about uh, our understanding of the UK as what I would call a territorial state, uh, its territorial nature. I then want to talk about uh, the trajectory of the Scottish independence referendum, how this happened, uh, what happened, uh, and what it all means. Well, who knows uh, the answer uh, to that question. And then I'd like to uh, talk briefly about what happens next and how the UK might or might not develop as what I would call not so much a territorial state as a multinational state, a state which provides the constitutional umbrella or underpinning, choose your metaphor as you think fit, for more than one nation. So let's uh, begin uh, with the territorial nature of the UK. Now you've uh, been, I think, on the course already uh, over some of the devolution ground. Uh, so this may be uh, a wee bit of repetition, uh, but I think it's quite important uh, to uh, construe the UK's territorial nature quite carefully. The traditional account of the UK, and I'm going back uh, a, a fairly long way now, has been of a unitary state, an unusually centralised unitary state, all power increasingly sucked into the maw of Westminster and Whitehall, uh, and 
uh, one government deciding everything. The joke was often told about the French Minister of Education uh, knowing exactly uh, what each French school child uh, was being taught uh, at exactly that time of day. Well, since the mid-1960s, uh, the, what used to be called low politics, local politics, has been dragged further and further uh, into Westminster and Whitehall education, being, as it happens, a very good example. But the UK actually hasn't always been a unitary state. In a sense, it's never been a unitary state for some of its population. 85% uh, of the population are in England, 15% are to be found in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And each of these parts of the UK has its own territory, its own institutions, its own history. And it is right, I think, uh, to describe the UK as a union state. Now, the clue is in the name, United Kingdom. It's formed, as it happens, not by one union, but by several unions. The oldest of these unions is the Union with Wales, formed by conquest, Norman conquest, as it happens. The most difficult and troublesome of these unions has been the Union with Ireland, which is a fairly terrible story of conquest and rebellion and suppression and further rebellion and secession and partition, uh, which I'm not going to go through today. But it certainly included, of course, a Union with Ireland Act, 1800 or so. That went well. Uh, the third union is, in my view, the archetypical one for our purposes, and that is the union between Scotland and, let's just say, England, uh, though it was at the time, in fact, uh, England and Wales. <coughs> the interesting thing about that union is that one has to go back rather before uh, the formal event of 1707, the Union of the Parliaments, and look at it through uh, the lens of Scottish history. Because the Scots, with one third of the UK's land mass, but seldom more than 10 or 15 percent of its population, always had a problem. They had a big, rather aggressive, hegemonising neighbour. How were they going to manage this? Could they fight them off? Could they even, at some point, perhaps, find a way of running them? My goodness, perhaps they did. Uh, they, in the end, adopted a strategy of union. And the idea of union was actually a Scottish strategy uh, from uh, the 15th and 16th centuries, of finding a way of living together with this big neighbour down south. England had secured its territory. Uh, Scotland, to be fair, had secured its territory with more or less, more or less, uh, uh, what passed for a state in the, in the late Middle Ages. But the two together formed a union. First, uh, a monarchical union in 1603, uh, when, uh, for dynastic reasons, the King of Scotland became uh, the King of England too. For, for reasons I've never understood, he seldom came back home after he had moved to London. Uh, and in 1707, what had been in part his ambition of uniting the two kingdoms and the two parliaments was negotiated in the usual messy political way of the time. But the interesting thing about that union was that it was not an absorption. Uh, Scotland retained, at the time when the church mattered more uh, than any political institution, and at a time when Scotland and England had just fought themselves to a standstill over what was the one true Protestant religion, they concluded there were two true Protestant religions, Presbyterian and sort of proto-democratic in Scotland, and Episcopal and Erastian state religion uh, in England. So the church remained for a long time one of the principal institutions of Scottish separateness. And it mattered a great deal more, much, much more uh, than it does today. And at a time when the state consisted largely of the law courts for its domestic purposes, uh, Scotland retained a separate legal system. So this is what we mean by the idea 
of a union state. That's to say, a state formed by the union of two pre-existing ones, but retaining the institutions, some of the institutions at least, uh, of the pre-existing nations. And that was the history of Scotland from 1707, really, uh, uh, until uh, the second half uh, of the 20th century, uh, when, uh, as you know, uh, this uh, pre-existing institutional framework became not merely legal and uh, ecclesiastical, but also administrative, and then eventually, uh, through the creation of the Scottish Parliament, uh, democratic uh, as well. And it's interesting uh, to ask ourselves uh, why that happened. And it happened because, of course, of political pressure. Uh, political pressure uh, in particular uh, from Scottish nationalism. Let's go uh, here and have a look at what kind of people the Scots thought and think they are. And interestingly, uh, you can tell the, the scale isn't great, uh, but the Scots primarily regard themselves as Scottish. And under the pressure, uh, you know, and this goes back to 1992, uh, the story is slightly different. We don't have really good data going way back uh, to the 1970s. But the pressure of Scottish nationalism started to build really in the 1970s with the arrival of oil. Uh, issues were more and more uh, construed uh, through a Scottish lens by people in Scotland. Uh, they did, however, uh, retain quite a lot of what you might call uh, residual Britishness. It's a slightly more fussy chart. Uh, people are invited to say, are they Scottish, not British? Are they British, not Scottish? Are they some kind of mixture? Uh, which is more, which is less? This is slightly old data. Uh, I didn't have the chance to update it. But what you will see uh, is that uh, quite a lot of people, the kind of modal identity, is more Scottish than British. But still, in fact, about two-thirds of the population uh, retain some sort of British identity, even if it is secondary. Uh, there are a few blue folk there on that line uh, uh, who eschew Britishness altogether. And they're about 30%. Uh, and that 30% is a number uh, we're going to hear again several times uh, during this lecture. So one of the responses to this nationalist pressure, to this feeling of identity, uh, was to democratise the existing Scottish institutions, uh, the old Scottish office as it was, that managed both Scottish public services, uh, the Scottish legal system, and put a government uh, and a parliament on top of that. All this happened, as you know, uh, in 1999, uh, at the same time uh, uh, as the uh, Welsh Assembly was created. There was, uh, you'll remember, uh, uh, a kind of failed attempt to do this in the late 1970s, with a somewhat botched scheme of devolution, which was rejected out of hand in Wales, and... Uh, accepted but only just in a referendum uh, in Scotland, but never implemented because it didn't meet the famous 40% threshold uh, in the legislation. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, it was probably just as well because it was a pretty hopeless scheme. Uh, what we have now, however, for Scotland and Wales is remarkably wide devolution. Virtually all domestic policy uh, other than uh, welfare payments is devolved in both Scotland and Wales. The principal differences between the two settlements are technical uh, and the fact that uh, justice, criminal justice and civil law, are devolved in Scotland but not in Wales, building on the fact that there was a pre-existing uh, legal uh, system in Scotland, which there wasn't and still isn't uh, in Wales. So, uh, by 1999, we see that we have uh, a separate Scottish Parliament, a devolved Parliament, very wide powers, responsible for near enough half the public spending in Scotland, uh, elected in a PR system, uh, created uh, by the Labour government uh, in 1997, very, very quickly. Uh, Labour and the Liberal Democrats uh, became the administration in that Parliament on a PR uh, system or list system. Uh, the uh, First, first Minister was Labour, the first Deputy First Minister was Conservative. They uh, ran uh, two terms uh, until 2007. Now, it's interesting to see the reaction of the Scottish Nationalist Movement to this. Their first reaction to devolution was to oppose it. 
Why? Because uh, it was seen as not enough, perhaps, or perhaps it was seen, uh, as some Labour figures unwisely said, as something that would kill nationalism, quotes, stone dead. Another very successful policy, that one. Uh, and uh, perhaps they were afraid that it would. But in the event, uh, they adopted it. They had no real choice. Uh, and they even uh, in the referendum of 1997 campaigned for it. And they gratefully adopted the role of opposition uh, in the new parliament. And they did that perfectly competently. And it's in the nature of things uh, that oppositions after a while become governments, particularly if governments turn out to be not as good as they should be. And in 2007, uh, the Scottish National Party formed a minority administration in Edinburgh. And in 2011, to their own surprise as well as everyone else's, they formed a majority administration in a system that was intended to produce coalition or minority government, because it was a list system, it was a PR-style system. Uh, the SNP gained 45% of the vote, but that gave them an overall majority. So it wasn't very proportional, uh, at that system. Uh, and that put them in a very interesting place. Because the Scottish National Party does what it says on the tin, which I think it does. Um, it says it is for the creation of a separate Scottish state of some sort. Uh, and independence is its aim. Uh, um, I'm not telling you anything they wouldn't tell you themselves, but some people are a little cynical about that aim. Uh, because uh, what do you do if your aim is to separate from an existing state? Are you in UDI territory? Are you revolutionary? Well, no, their uh, route to independence, under the guidance of a very distinguished lawyer uh, who was an SNP supporter, indeed a hereditary SNP, uh, uh, well, leader, let's just say, Neil McCart, very fine man. Uh, Neil, um, Neil said, no, you must have a constitutional route, and the constitutional route is a referendum. You must ask the people, and uh, once the people have been uh, asked this question, if they say yes, you become independent. If you say no, they don't. The referendum as a, a route to independence was also politically very useful for the Scottish National Party because it enabled them to say to the ordinary voters who did not support independence, and actually all the data tell us that uh, back in the day, the only people who supported independence were those, red, uh, those blue folk at the top there. About 30% of people were in favour of independence, as I will uh, probably have data to show you in a moment. Let's see if we can move on one. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the people who uh, were uh, Scottish, not British, were inclined to support independence. People were more Scottish than British, less so. So uh, identity and support for independence were uh, linked. And going back to uh, before the referendum, historically, when this game started, this is way back in um, uh, 2009, I think, 2010, uh, these were the constitutional preferences of Scottish folk. Support for independence was quite low. So the idea for the Scottish National Party to be able to say, you may vote for us for the Scottish Parliament, but don't worry, you don't have to support independence to do that, because we'll give you another question, another opportunity, a referendum uh, uh, to deal uh, with that. So uh, it made excellent political sense for the SNP to go for a constitutional route via a referendum uh, to have independence. They didn't expect to have to deliver it, because they didn't expect to win a majority uh, in the Scottish Parliament. To their own astonishment, they did. For about a year after that victory, uh, there was a period of, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Uh, the interesting thing is that it's the UK government which facilitated and crystallised the referendum. They said, you've got a mandate. Uh, interesting technical question. If you stand for election to a parliament, which doesn't have the power to do something on the basis that we'll do something. <clears throat> Is that a mandate? But politically it was a mandate. And the UK government agreed uh, to facilitate, to make the referendum legally possible, uh, because it was strictly speaking within the powers of Parliament at Westminster rather than uh, in uh, the Parliament at Holyrood's powers. Uh, a so-called Section 30 order was passed. The UK set some conditions, but they weren't in fact very onerous conditions. Uh, the condition uh, that there would be a simple question, should you be an independent state or not, that it should be regulated by the, the Electoral Commission 
uh, and that it should be held no later than it was actually held uh, in September uh, of last year. So that led us to a referendum campaign of more than two years long, punctuated by a number of interesting events. Uh, the big event from the SNP's perspective, at least from the Scottish Government's perspective, uh, was the publication of a doorstop of a white paper. It, uh, I weighed it on the kitchen scales when I got it, rather than read it. Um, it was huge. Um, it was very light in content, however, uh, because it merely said, we should be independent, it will be very good, and the terms will be negotiated. Uh, there was a wonderful set of frequently asked questions. Uh, the challenge to the Scottish Government was that they had to answer the questions that people would ask uh, before the people could decide. Uh, so they were all the questions they could think of down and gave an answer. My favourite uh, was, would Scotland have uh, an entry in the Eurovision Song Contest? Uh, sadly, we would. Uh, <laughs> which I'm not looking forward to. I'm glad. Well, there are many, many arguments against independence, but uh, uh, Lulu singing Boom Bang a Bang once again is certainly one of them. Uh, the um, uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish Government white paper uh, was an interesting document in other respects, however, because it presented something uh, which is best described as independence very light. So independence was mostly about things that wouldn't change. The monarchy wouldn't change. Fair enough. Uh, the currency wouldn't change. That became a very, uh, very um, difficult argument. All sorts of things would be retained, including, bizarrely enough, even for a while, the DWP uh, administering uh, Scottish welfare. Uh, so uh, that, of course, well, I mean, one can understand the politics of that. Uh, independence was seen as threatening, uh, seen as uh, it was seen as change, it was seen as risk. Uh, the whole purpose of the White Paper uh, was a de-risking purpose. Independence uh, was a very small thing indeed. Uh, the UK government's answer, and the answer of the other side, uh, was not unsurprisingly uh, to talk about risks. Uh, independence would have economic risks, it would have risks uh, to public expenditure, it would have risks uh, to pensions, uh, and so on. Uh, the Yes campaign, uh, which was nominally at least wider than the SNP, and as the campaign one did actually become uh, wider than the SNP in an interesting sense, was relentlessly positive. Everything would be wonderful. And those who suggested it would not uh, were clearly talking Scotland down. Uh, the pro-UK campaign uh, wasn't exactly relentlessly negative, but certainly it did talk an awful lot about risks, and it struggled to find a positive way of putting its story across. When I uh, came here, I think it was last, no, last uh, spring, was it? Nine months before the referendum. Um, I showed the, uh, the data on how the campaign was going um, uh, and summarised them, I think, by saying nothing very much had changed. What seemed to be happening for most of this two-year period was that uh, the 30% the or so people who were absolutely committed to independence remained that way uh, and they attracted uh, a share of these people in the middle, uh, the people uh, who were in favour of devolution as their preference, but if they didn't have a more de devolution offer, uh, they might uh, not uh, go for remaining in the UK. And if you split those numbers up, you will see that uh, uh, about a potential majority of people were in favour of uh, a combination of independence and so-called devolution max. And I'll come back later on uh, to talk about what devolution max uh, <coughs> might be. So what we saw in the campaign for the first year or more uh, was a total uh, yes vote uh, in the polling of around 40%. It was going to be 60-40 and it stayed that way for a long time. But most people, very sensibly, uh, shut their ears to all this noise for most of the two years of the campaign. Uh, most people, sensibly in my view, uh, didn't actually think about whether they wanted to be Scottish or not Scottish, part of Britain or not part of Britain, uh, until they had to make up their minds. And at the very end of the campaign, the numbers did shift. Now here are a couple of graphs, and I've given you two graphs for two reasons. One, to show you what the polls were showing. I'll come back to the vow in a minute. And what you'll see uh, is more or less what I've told you. 
A lot of up and down, mostly dri driven by different uh, polling technique. But just towards the end, you saw a bit of a shift. A bit of a shift in the direction of yes. Uh, the bookies weren't fooled. Uh, the bookies took the view, uh, this is the implied probability taken from the odds, and the odds were uh, <coughs> reasonably constant. Now, a couple of blips in the odds. But at no point did the bookies think there was anything other than a 0.3% chance, uh, chance uh, of independence answer uh, being yes. Uh, and it turned out, of course, the bookies were right. Uh, the final result, as you probably know, uh, was uh, just over 55 for yes and just under 45 for no. On any view, uh, that's a decisive result. In an election, that would be a landslide. But in a referendum, 45% of people <coughs> saying... Uh, they're, uh, not, um, they're not in favour of remaining in the present state. It's still you know, a pretty substantial uh, number of folks <coughs> saying we're not happy. I'm going to come back to what they're not happy with in a minute. Uh, one of the interesting events of the campaign uh, was what the constitutional policy offerings were uh, as the campaign went on. Uh, when we began the campaign... Uh, we were in the position of having an existing Scottish Parliament uh, with powers which had been extended by legislation, uh, the Scotland Act 2012, uh, with which I was personally quite associated, to give the uh, Scottish Parliament more tax powers in particular, to give it control over some of income tax. As the campaign began, each of the three main UK political parties decided they'd better have another look at their devolution offering. Go back to where the population were, a majority of them wanted uh, more devolution. Right? They either wanted independence or they wanted devomax, whatever that was. Uh, and the parties each set up uh, reviews, commissions, uh, to decide on uh, what they, they would offer. In the event each of them produced reports, they weren't all that different. Most of them focused on increasing <laughs> the amount of income tax devolution, but there was no common position between them. Uh, the view was taken that that would be a matter for the general election. Uh, when the numbers started to wobble, the back end here, people started to wobble, and they began to say, well, perhaps we should be a bit more concrete about our devolution offering, because if this is really about people's constitutional preferences, perhaps if we improve the constitutional preference, get to a bit closer to where the median voter is, we're more likely to be successful. And there were, in fact, two announcements made uh, in the closing stages of the campaign by the pro-UK side. One was the announcement of a timetable and process by which the three uh, offerings of the pro-union parties would become one offering. And the timetable was very tight. It was uh, by uh, the middle of November... Uh, heads of agreement by the end of November, uh, uh, a command paper, and by, sorry, by the end of November, uh, detailed agreement, and by Burns Night, bizarrely enough, uh, draft clauses. Burns Night was just a week or two back, uh, and the draft clauses have indeed been produced. So the first thing that was proposed uh, was a timetable and process. And then uh, the second thing, uh, in the, um, the constitutional um, paper of record, for Scotland, which is the daily record, uh, the three uh, pro-union parties, the Prime Minister uh, and the leader of the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats, made a so-called vow that there would be more devolution, and they specified the content uh, of this more devolution. You can look it up if you like. What was interesting about it was it promised some welfare devolution, some tax devolution, and guaranteed uh, Scotland's old friend, the Barnett formula. So it was an interesting mixture uh, of... Um, forward offer and, and reassurance. Now whether the vow and the timetable uh, caused this wobble to go back up again, we will never know. I rather suspect not. The bookies certainly didn't think so. Nevertheless, uh, it was what was offered in the referendum campaign if Scotland remained inside the United Kingdom. Now, as I said, the result in the end was 55-45. It was a very interesting result, not just the overall result, but what it told us about who was voting and why. 
It's been a reasonable amount of analysis of who voted yes and who voted no. The elderly did not vote yes. 30% or so of the over 65s only voted yes. Not surprising. Um, it's entirely rational from their point of view, particularly if they're relying on an old age pension. They're better off, by and large, didn't vote yes. Okay? Something like 50% of people in the social classes C2DE voted yes. That was nearly a majority in those social classes. 66% of people in the 20% most deprived areas of Scotland voted yes, whereas only 33% of people in the best area, the better, better off areas, top 20%. It's a very distinct social class gradient. It's not before seen on constitutional questions. The SNP support has traditionally not been in the urban working class and the poor. So this is a big thing that happened towards the end of the referendum campaign. Interestingly, identity still mattered. Only 25% of people living in Scotland but born outside Scotland uh, voted yes. These are all survey numbers, so they're not exact, but they tell you something really quite, uh, quite important. And, of course, more men than women. So the archetypical yes which, which voter... Which way round, sorry. So more, more men than women voted, no, uh, voted yes. Women voted no, no right. by a majority, by a substantial majority. Uh, <laughs> men were approaching 50% towards yes. So um, this has all sorts of interesting political effects now. The archetypical new nationalist voter is poor, male and working class and is in the west of Scotland. He used to be the archetypical Labour voter. Big, big shift. The SNP spent the 1980s replacing Conservative members of Parliament in the east and north of Scotland. Alex Hammond's been representing Banff and Buchan for Yonks and hopes to represent Gordon, uh, all up uh, in the top right-hand corner of the country. Uh, the SNP have been strong in places uh, like Angus, and Perthshire, to former Tory areas, but the yes vote was strong in former urban areas, or former industrial urban areas. Four of Scotland's local authorities uh, voted yes, and they were Glasgow, the city of Glasgow, the most Labour city in the known universe, voted yes. Dundee, former industrial city, uh, on the right-hand side of the country. And two west of Scotland, uh, former industrial areas, Western Bartonshire, home of the shipyards in Clydebank, which is my hometown. It's a great blow to me, I can tell you. Uh, uh, and North Lanarkshire, former steel and coal heartland. So very interesting uh, demographics there. So this all matters not purely for academic interest, but because of the effect <coughs> The effect, the political effect, was interesting first uh, because the losers behaved like winners. This was great news. They had secured 45% of the vote. It's more than they expected to secure, though interestingly, uh, that's more than the, as well, the Yes movement as a whole. They thought they were very pleased with the result. They did very well. Uh, the Scottish National Party and the Yes campaign actually thought they had won. Uh, they didn't believe these polls. No, no, they believed the polls they paid for, which were, of course, private and secret. Um, you always believe what you pay for, even if it's nonsense. Uh, and they had commissioned a firm, uh, a firm of Canadian cephalogists who told them, I'm afraid, what they wanted to hear, uh, that they were going to win. Indeed, that they, the numbers were going to be the other way around. These guys told them it was going to be 56, 44 in their direction. Hence, poor Mr. Salmon's bleak, bleak face in the middle uh, of the night as he left his constituency. He really did think they'd won. That wasn't put on, that was genuine. Uh, and uh, nobody else thought that. Every other cephalogist and every other private poll maybe said, said that the, the no side uh, were going to win. But nevertheless, uh, lots and lots of people uh, who were brought into the campaign 
uh, brought into politics by the referendum campaign were buoyed up by it. And in the immediate aftermath of the vote, uh, we saw a, a, a very interesting social movement, actually. Lots of pro-yes people saying, well, we nearly made it, we're going to keep going. Uh, and they took for a while, I think you may have stopped doing this now, they took for a while call, to calling themselves the 45, after the 45%, not after the failed Jacobite rebellion, I want you to understand that. Um, the interesting thing about the 45 is that they aren't. They are actually 30 plus 15. Thirtiest core traditional SNP support, broadly speaking. 15 are the people who were brought in to supporting independence for reasons that aren't essentially constitutional. Remember, this referendum was held at the end of the longest recession most of us, all of you pretty well, can remember. Most people can remember. It's been held at a time uh, when living standards have been flat or declining for most people for a very long time. It's been held at a time when people at the bottom of the heap, particularly those reliant on welfare, have had an extremely hard time for a very long time. It's been held at a time when, the, when globalization and the financial crisis and all those things have made people very, very pissed off with politics indeed. 30 plus 15 almost got nationalism uh, over the 50% barrier. The interesting question um, for those who are supporters of nationalism, if you can't win in those circumstances, in what circumstances can you win? How bad things do things have to be for the anti-vote People were opposed to things that are happening to them to be big enough to get you over that 50% barrier. Well, we'll see perhaps another day. But because the losers are behaving like winners, um, the membership of the SNP has rocketed. It is said now to be 100,000. Uh, that's about 10 times the membership of any other Scottish political party. Extraordinary increase in membership. Uh, from enthusiastic people who've never been members of political parties before, uh, who've got the bug, got the independence bug, big time. This, had, this has had a number of effects. The first effect uh, was the effect it had on the negotiations to put into effect the offering, the vow, the promise of more devolution. It, it was said, and very rightly, uh, that this would be done after the referendum and the Scottish Government and the other parties should be at the table too. Try and negotiate a deal. Once, if the people still decide to stay in the UK, let's see if we, we can negotiate uh, a stable devolution settlement. This was done by a body called the Smith Commission. The Smith Commission consisted of Lord Smith uh, and various other party representatives. It produced a package which was markedly more forward-leaning, markedly more devolutionary uh, than had been canvassed by the three parties before the referendum. So all of income tax virtually would be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Substantial slug of welfare. Give the Scottish Parliament a welfare budget of about three billion a year. Total welfare and spending in Scotland being about 20 odd billion a year. So quite a significant chunk of welfare. A few more small taxes, including the vexed air passenger duty. And this has produced a system which on any view, whether you like it or not, it's one of the most decentralised systems you will find anywhere. Now, explaining this um, to politicians in particular, I find very difficult. Uh, because uh, most politicians, in my experience, can manage one number uh, uh, with difficulty. Uh, to, make, to understand the extent of decentralisation, you have to do two numbers. The best way to do it is on a graph. I'm sorry, this is a slightly fussy graph. And uh, if you'll forgive me, I'll do a bit of pointing. What we've done here uh, 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 is to show uh, in two dimensions the extent of decentralization in federal countries in the OECD. Uh, there are lots and lots uh, uh, of decentralized models, uh, some federal, some quasi-federal, some not federal, local government style. Um, and you can decentralise spending, uh, which we put along the x-axis on the bottom. And you can decentralise taxing, which we put on the y-axis on the top. 
Uh, most places find it easier to decentralise spending rather than taxation for reasons that are obvious. It's easy enough to take uh, decentralised spending decisions. Decentralised tax decisions le lead you into issues of tax competition. People move to avoid the tax. Uh, they're less inclined to move to get the service, interestingly. And what you'll find is a very rough correlation between the two. So way up on the top right-hand corner there, you've got the 4,000 miles wide of Canada. Uh, roughly speaking, half the taxes are devolved to the provinces, and roughly speaking, 60-odd percent of the expenditure is run by the provinces. Way down in the bottom left-hand corner is poor old Greece. Uh, and to the extent that they spend anything anymore, um, it's spent by the central government, and to the extent that they pay any taxes, uh, they pay them uh, to the central government as well. Uh, most places are on a very rough straight line. Look at the three red dots. The bottom red dot is the Scottish Parliament as it is today. Half of public expenditure, but very little tax. Okay. Look at the second red dot. That's the Scottish Parliament as it will be in 2016. Slightly more than half of public expenditure. And according to this number, I think these numbers aren't quite right, I'd put it slightly higher, uh, um, but under 20% of taxes. Look at the third red dot. That's the Scottish Parliament as it will be after the Smith Commission proposals. Uh, it will have more than 50% of public expenditure to play with, and it will have near enough 40% of taxation. It's a bit under 40% of taxation. It's up there with Switzerland and the decentralisation stakes. Um, it's not quite as decentralised as Canada. Um, it's beating Germany on penalties. Um, it's ahead of Denmark on tax decentralisation, if not spending, and that's local government uh, uh, in Denmark. Um, it is ahead of Spain on expenditure, but slightly behind Spain on taxation. So it's certainly uh, at the top end of the decentralisation bundle. What? I think, Mr. Dobb, I think I'm guessing that England would be about there, wouldn't it? it yes, would be, it would be. England would be where Scotland with was. with Scotland as it is now, but way back here. Yep, that's right, because so that's, that's, that would that's represent local government. I think forward, England would England. be approximately here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Approximately here. Mm. Um, and we'll stay that way, I suspect. And we'll stay that way, we which is itself uh, it a tells you something interesting, yes. So, uh, uh, this is the production of the Smith Commission. It was more ambitious than proposed, partly because of the political environment into which it was launched, uh, with uh, uh, people, um, losers behaving like winners, uh, and partly because the Scottish Government were at the table asking for more, uh, which is what I would expect of them uh, to do. Uh, this is essentially uh, the offering, if you like, uh, and uh, it will, unless there is uh, something uh, supervenes, uh, uh, be uh, what happens, uh, certainly uh, no later than, I would guess, 2020, maybe before that, uh, uh, for Scotland. Unless something supervenes. And that takes us on to uh, the what happens next part of my talk. Uh, which I will make reasonably brief. Um, there are all sorts of excitements about the coming general election. Uh, the two main UK parties will be lucky if they get two-thirds of the vote between them. Opinion polls tell us. <coughs> they are neck and neck uh, in the likely number of seats, and neither of them looks like getting an overall majority. Uh, what's going on here? Well, some of the th same things are going on here as were going on in the Scottish referendum. There's a lot of people pissed off about a lot of things. People are voting UKIP, apparently. We'll see if they actually do. Uh, people are voting Green. Uh, people aren't voting Liberal, as far as I can tell. Uh, but we'll see. Um, there might well be a situation in which either of the major parties, uh, if it's the largest one, uh, seeks to form a minority government with some kind of confidence and supply arrangement, or indeed without one, uh, patching things together as it goes along, or even a formal coalition. Now, the interesting thing about that number 45 is that it loses a referendum. 
But if the SNP get 45% of the votes in a first-past-the-post general election system, it wins an election. So suddenly, there is the possibility, and let's be absolutely clear, this is only a possibility, uh, that there will be a substantial phalanx of SNP MPs uh, in Westminster, hoping to have some influence over the formation of a government. It will be fascinating to see what effect that has, if it does happen, uh, and if anybody is willing to do business with them. Uh, various proposals have been made by them as to what they would want, um, uh, not replacing Trident. Um, it sounds to me, to be honest, like a very easy offer uh, for a new government that can't afford anything at all, but we'll see. Uh, more interestingly, from our perspective today, uh, the Scottish Government seems to be going for this interesting notion of Devo Max. Come back to what it means in a minute. Uh, should anyone give it to them? Well, an interesting question. Uh, Devo Max is, however, the mirror image of the other issue which is bound to arise, and that is English votes. <coughs> eh? uh, Scotland has a wide set of devol devolved powers now including some tax powers. Uh, what's the place of Scottish MPs at Westminster? They're fun and games. Because, of course, uh, the SNP's policy, not wholly uh, uh, logical and certainly not always followed, has been that they don't vote in English matters in Westminster. It's been a painless offer uh, because they've never been relevant to the Westminster arithmetic, uh, at least not since uh, 1979, uh, when uh, they helped bring down uh, the Callaghan government. Uh, but it's possible uh, that they will become relevant in 2015. And surprise, surprise, they've discovered that they really need to vote on English issues. Uh, oddly enough, I agree with them, although not for the reason that they give. Uh, and that takes us on to uh, a much wider topic, which we might discuss in questions if you're interested. In. What is the answer uh, to the West Lothian question? But let me speak briefly uh, about the mirror image of uh, English votes, and that you is... Deconstruct the West Lothian question just one more time. Okay, the West Lothian question is this. Uh, if I am elected uh, to Westminster to represent the seat of West Lothian, uh, as, the late, as the great Tam D. L. was, he's still going, Tam, uh, I can vote on health matters in England, or on education in England, but I cannot vote on education or health matters in Scotland because they are devolved in Scotland. Uh, in other words, uh, MPs representing any of the devolved areas uh, are able to vote on English matters when English MPs cannot vote on those matters affecting Scotland. No MP can vote on those matters affecting Scotland, or indeed Wales, or indeed Northern Ireland. Um, this goes back a long, long way. Um, before it was the West Lothian question, it, it was Gladstone's insoluble puzzle in trying to figure out uh, uh, home rule for Northern Ireland. He gave up. It was beyond the wit of man, he said, uh, to devise a system. Uh, the uh, pragmatic solution that was adopted between 1923 uh, and 1972 for Northern Ireland was simply to cut down the number of Northern Irish MPs so that the problem uh, was vanishingly small and not, uh, unlikely to arise. Uh, that's pragmatic and not logical because if it arises, uh, it's just as, just as big a problem uh, if there's only... Uh, 13 uh, MP, only, only 8 MPs as opposed to, to 13, and that certainly I don't think would work for Scotland. Uh, we can go back to West Lothian uh, in questions uh, if people are interested in it. What's fascinating for me um, is that the SNP seem to be arguing for a Devo Max solution, and they seem to construe Devo Max to be that Westminster deals with foreign affairs and defence, and Holyrood deals with everything else. The second iteration of that is, well, of course, uh, Westminster also deals with macroeconomic matters and the currency, because, of course, that was their view uh, in relation to the um, independent Scotland. It would, it, it would uh, uh, have the same currency. So one assumes that Devo Max Scotland would also uh, have the same currency. The interesting thing about Devo Max as a proposition, uh, to, to oversimplify it, uh, is that it would put Scotland in the same position as the Channel Islands. That's to say uh, all domestic matters were dealt with domestically, and foreign affairs was dealt with uh, by what used to be called the Imperial Parliament at Westminster. Uh, tell me the important thing about the Channel Islands. Well, answer me this question. How many MPs do they send to Westminster? 
precisely zero. They're not actually part of the United Kingdom at all. So Devo Max is a kind of a form, rather botched form, of independence. So 2015 will be a fascinating period. Uh, we have no idea what the election result will be, either north or south of the border. Um, it's not at all clear, actually, that the Scottish National Party will do as well as the yes people did in the referendum, for a variety of reasons. Uh, people might well focus on the election as a choice between the main parties. Turnout might well be different. Turnout in the referendum was extraordinarily <coughs> high, particularly uh, in the poorest areas, um, not as high as it was in turnout in East Renfrewshire, which is the poshest bit of Glasgow, was over 90% in the referendum. Turnout overall was 80%. Turnout in Glasgow, 75 which is extraordinary levels of participation. Whether we see those levels of participation in a general election uh, is another matter. So, what does this mean for the UK? Well, uh, the issue of Scottish independence will bubble away. Uh, the territorial constitution of the UK isn't yet wholly settled or stable. At the very least, we're going to see uh, the Smith Commission proposals working their way through, perhaps uh, via the Scotland Act 2012. Uh, so we might see uh, the first Scottish tax rates being set as early as 2016 under the current plan. That would be very interesting. We might see even more wide-ranging Scottish tax changes uh, after that. Uh, will the UK uh, have a narrative of its own? Well, it could. It could have a comprehensive or at least a comprehensible territorial narrative about being a state which provides the architecture for more than one nation. Uh, not just Scotland or England, uh, but the constitutional architecture for Wales and in a different way the constitutional architecture for Northern Ireland. What's very striking about this uh, as, a, as a constitutional proposition is that the UK has identified itself as a voluntary association. It is said two years ago to the people of Scotland, if you wish to choose to leave the United Kingdom, we're not going to stand in your way. Contrast that with the reaction of the Spanish government to the proposed referendum in Catalonia. It has long said, since John Major's time, to the people of Northern Ireland, if you wish to leave and join the Republic of Ireland, you're free to do so, provided that's the democratic will of the folk there. We've had one border poll which was a political event. It may be that one day uh, that will change also. So the UK has identified itself as a multinational state. It's identified itself as a voluntary association. It's about to turn itself uh, into the one, one of the most decentralised federations uh, in the world in respect of at least one part, or well, not, as Tony rightly says, uh, in respect of England. Uh, so those of us who uh, mildly obsess about the UK's territorial arrangements are not going to be out of a job uh, for a long time yet. Thank you very much. Okay, a lot of meat uh, there. Um, perhaps I could just get us going uh, with one question uh, begged by what you were saying at the very end there, which is to do with the way in which Scotland has, in effect, um, by force of its own voting, not only to create this voluntary association, but also, in a sense, to, uh, I'm not saying this de negatively necessary, to destabilise the United Kingdom, which had sort of more or less existed in its previous form very easily, for aiming off for Ireland for a relatively long time. But by, in a sense, identifying this significant minority of people in the country, who in, in Scotland, who would want or might want to be, might Scotland to be an independent state, have created a position in which England's position within the United Kingdom now looks odd as well. So um, Scotland feels it's slightly oddly situated within the United Kingdom, or as many people in Scotland clearly do. And by saying that, and by holding the referendum, it's made England's centralised government run from Westminster, the English votes for English laws issue, and so on, visible in a way it never was before. England, uh, you know, arguably had to hold back within the United Kingdom to make it work at all. 
And now some English MPs are beginning to talk about asserting Englishness and English votes. And question, therefore, if the Scots, if the SNP did find itself in government, would it be in its interest to promote that sense of English, um, what's the word I'm looking for, English discomfort in order that in the end the English and English MPs and council leaders began to say, oh, well, let's just be, let's just be done with Scotland. Well, the answer to the final part of your question is obviously yes. Right. Um, the, it is, the, the SNP, uh, their objective is to separate England and Scotland into two separate states. Um, the analogy with Czechoslovakia is very interesting. Uh, uh, the, um, those two states separated not when a majority of the population in either uh, appeared to want it, uh, but because the administration uh, in the Slovak half of it uh, uh, and the administration in the Czech half of it wanted to go in their different directions. Uh, and uh, it is manifestly in the interests of the Kurdish National Party uh, to persuade the English that this present system is no good and is bad for them as well. Now, I, as happened, I don't think it is, but I'll, go, I'll come on to why in a moment. Um, but hence one sees uh, Nicola's recent announcement about um, the mass ranks of SNP voters designing in English health services. Uh, uh, and uh, the... Um, the past master at this is my old friend, Mr. Salmond, who hopes to be in Westminster representing Gordon. And his principal aim, I'm quite sure, will be to get under the skin of right-wing Conservative MPs. And he'll be jolly good at it. He'll be very good at it. Uh, so, yes, that's the tactical uh, reality in response to your question. But the, the constitutional reality is much more interesting. Um, the tactical reality is just good fun, if you like. Um, what's very, very striking about the UK um, is that the Scots talk about the UK all the time. We're very, very interested in this, in our relationship with England, and uh, where, you know, how the UK's territory uh, works and what the constitution is. The English, very sensibly, don't pay any attention to this for most of the time uh, because they are 85% of the total. Right? Now they are. England is 10 times the size of Scotland. It's near enough 20 times the size of Wales and near enough 30 times the size of Northern Ireland in population. In population. Okay? Um, if... Um, uh, there was something which was being done uh, by the Scots or the Welsh or the Northern Irish, which was clearly contrary to the interests of England. Uh, England has absolutely no difficulty in saying, we're not up for that. Okay? Uh, England dominates the House of Commons on any view. Um, it has 85% of the members. And the relationship between uh, uh, a big country and some small countries, is in a sense analogous uh, to the arrangements in a federal state where you've got states of different sizes. Now, in federal states, it's, it, 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 it's tidier. Uh, but nevertheless, if you look at the US Constitution, little states have got the same pool in the Senate as big ones, more or less. Uh, what people are saying there, and uh, what people said uh, at, at the time of um, uh, the drawing up of the Constitution was that little states required some protection. So what the UK Constitution does in a slightly untidy way, it must be said, is give rather special protection uh, to the Scots and the Welsh and Northern Irish because in the end, uh, England could, if it chose, override their interests. Now, uh, and the smaller nations have for many years uh, traded on some ways the tolerance, in some ways the generosity, in some ways the indifference of England uh, to these questions. So... Um, I don't actually think the English votes question is all that big a question. And therefore, I don't think it has, requires all that big an answer. But just at the moment, um, it is politically salient because of the Scottish referendum, but it's also a proxy for English nationalism and UKIP. Uh, so the uh, English um, right wing of the English Conservative Party uh, need to be on that bandwagon to make sure that UKIP doesn't grab votes from for that reason. So we'll see if some parliamentary process uh, that fixes this kind of a known problem uh, uh, can be devised. I've certainly proposed one which the Mackay Commission more or less agreed with. So um, the real English question, however, is the other English question, and that's where they are on this graph. England is still the most centralised state in Western Europe. Um, it's the most fiscally centralised, it's the most administratively centralised, it's the most politically centralised. We've managed to give the benefits of decentralisation to the Scots, the Welsh and Northern Irish, and to a trivial degree to the Londoners, really effectively recreating something that should never have been abolished uh, uh, by Mrs Thatcher, but we've never succeeded 
in doing what every government says it wants to do, uh, which is decentralise power uh, to the different bits of England. And that's the real English question. OK. Right. Any... Uh, just, just... Let's take a question there first, and then I'll come back to you over here. Yeah. Do you think if uh, the UK voted uh, to leave the European Union that Scotland mm -hmm. would be in their right to have a new uh, independent referendum? Um, is, is there a question of rights here? I'm not sure, but I think the political demand would be very hard to resist. Um, the, the view, uh, the data suggests that Scotland is marginally more Europhile uh, than the rest of the UK. There's not a lot in it. Uh, the Scottish political elite is markedly more Europhile, uh, and uh, this is all part of the identification uh, of the UK into two parts, uh, Scotland and London, uh, and the South East. Uh, and I think the uh, demand uh, would be in part factitious uh, if that were to happen, but I suspect it might well be, um, it might well be um, acknowledged. Um, but it would be an awful choice for Scotland to have to make. Let's imagine the UK decided to leave the EU, which is barking, let's be clear. Right? Well, let's, let's imagine that it chose to do that. Scotland would then be faced with a choice of leaving its principal market the place where all its goods go, where its trade goes, where its people go uh, to work, where its investment comes from, where its investments are made, and where all its customers are, uh, for a bit of European uh, theory, it would seem, it would be an unenviable choice to have to make. And it might well be, if the Scots were given that choice, they would rather grudgingly say, oh, well, we better stick with the devil we know. It would uh, also, let's hope it never comes to that. It would also create the fascinating possibility of Scotland being in the EU when the UK wasn't, but still using the pound. I mean, there are all sorts of yeah. dimensions of complexity that, uh, that uh, the voters can wish upon us, which is always good about elections. Yes. Yes. Very good. Right. Question here and then over here. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about Scottish Labour and EU Labour in general and about how they kind of caught between everything, especially in regards to kind of English votes and obviously they have the most to lose in Scotland at the moment. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about what their best strategy should be. <laughs> and you could, they're just hopeless. And you could add to this question, the Scottish, what the SNP have done, it might be argued, is that they revealed that the Labour Party in Scotland had taken a great chunk of its vote for granted. Discuss. Well, to add to that um, point. I do actually agree with that analysis. I think the um, let's go back to before the referendum, go back to some of this data. Right, let's, yeah, I mean, these things go backwards, never mind. Um, uh, look at uh, this data. Okay. Um, you go back a few years, independence wasn't at the top of anybody's mind. Um, uh, and it was the opportunity of government, uh, combined with the overall political and economic situation, which gave the Scottish National Party uh, the chance to get where they've got to. And they got the opportunity of government because the Labour Party weren't very good. Uh, so the Scottish Labour Party has been very weak. Um, it has not, I think it's fair to say, it's taken its, its vote for granted. Um, it has never wholly um, understood uh, itself as both a Scottish and a UK party. Um, uh, uh, and the, you know, the, fact, the fact that its last leader left grumbling that she was treated as a branch office is a, um, is a symbol of that. Um, I mean, all of our, leaving aside the SNP for the moment, uh, all of the UK political parties are becoming gradually hollowed out. We, I mean, we've lost mass parties. Again, I'll leave aside the SNP for, uh, we're different for different reasons. Uh, and that is true, uh, probably truer uh, in Scotland, not least because for a long time in the areas where it was successful, Labour had no competition. Um, so you know, the, the, if the Labour Party chose at the Emperor's horse, the Emperor's horse, which might well have been elected. So what should they do about this? Well, um, they, did, they did ask, <laughs> they asked too. Um, first, you do need to think about your personnel. Okay, they've had a personnel change, uh, and whether Mr Murphy is everyone's cup of tea, certainly very lively and very energetic. Uh, uh, second, um, you do need some policies. You have to make some offering to the Scottish people. Um, that, uh, in part, that includes 
a constitutional offer. Now, you've got to get yourself to wherever the median voter now is on the constitutional question. Uh, but actually, I think more important, uh, you have to have some solid policies for both the um, devolved and the reserved public services uh, so that you can attract the voters. Um, that's a pretty tall order between now and, uh, and May. Um, so it'll be fascinating to see how well they do. I mean, there's another issue, is there not, that the, you, if you looked at Scottish voting, certainly in the general election, but also in Scottish elections, it appears to be very heavily left of centre. I mean, the parties would all describe them on about 85% of the voters appear to be voting for parties that describe themselves as left of centre. And yet, I think I've seen opinion poll evidence that shows that the values, attributes and so on of people in Scotland are incredibly close to people in England, which apparently has a more right of centre political system. Is that, well, is I mean, that you, true? You put your finger on a paradox and the data I've just displayed uh, uh, illustrates oh, that paradox. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the Conservative Party um, is the only party ever to have gained a majority of the seats and votes in a general election in Scotland. Uh, Conservatives don't believe me when I tell them that. It's because it was in 1955. It was a while back. And there were reasons not to do with conservatism, but rather unionism of a different sort. Uh, and the, all of the Scottish parties present themselves uh, uh, as left of centre. All of them... Um, there's a kind of uh, what you might describe as a national myth, and I'm not saying that critically, a national myth that Scotland is an egalitarian, communitarian, social democratic kind of a place. Um, look at the data. Okay, red line uh, is England, uh, blue line is Scotland. A minority of Scots think we should increase tax and public spending. Uh, that minority more or less tracks English opinion. In the last couple of years, there's a bit of a divergence. I think you'll find, I haven't got the 2012-2013 data, I think you'll find that both countries have gone up a bit uh, as the effect of um, uh, uh, austerity uh, uh, comes through. But that doesn't, that's not a story about two radically different places, just as it isn't two radically different places in respect of the EU. And the Scots can be as mean-minded and xenophobic as anybody else. They just pretend that they're not. That's their national story uh, uh, to themselves. Uh, but the, the great tactical success of the Labour Party in the 1980s was to present conservatism as anti-Scottish. <coughs> the 1980s were a time, let's be tactful, of um, uh, economic reconstruction, the closure of shipyards and coal mines and steel mills and so on. Uh, and this was uh, deeply, deeply resented, obviously, in those communities, uh, and deeply, deeply resented and presented as an attack on the very nature of Scotland. <coughs> Scotland was more... <coughs> proportionately more dependent on heavy industry than the rest of the UK. The, e economically, the interesting thing is that Scotland went through a terrible period of this reconstruction, just as the North East did. Scotland recovered and the North East did not. Scotland's the third or fourth richest region of the UK at the moment. It's got the highest uh, employment rate. At the moment, it's got a lower than uh, UK average unemployment. Um, it's got the third highest disposable household income per head, etc., etc. Scotland's actually economically, uh, in relative terms, the UK doing quite well. Which is not to say that there aren't 20% of the people at the bottom of the heap are doing badly. Right? Uh, but relative to other parts of the UK, uh, Scotland is economically really quite successful. Uh, so there's a paradox here. Uh, and the paradox is that this story that Scots tell themselves about how they are left of centre, and actually that they're rather poorly off, and <laughs> they're really quite uh, well off. Uh, uh, and uh, national myths are very, very important. Uh, and a myth is not simply something that isn't true. A myth is a powerful story that you tell yourself about yourself, and that's the story that the Scots tell themselves, and it's reflected in their voting patterns. So even the Scottish Conservative Party is for more public spending. Quite extraordinary. Okay, Keith. and then oh, I'll take, can I just come take, I'll take you and then two questions here. Sorry, yes, Keith. Two, two brief points. Uh, you said that the uh, yes vote in the referendum was 30% core SNP plus 15%. But of course, in 2011, the SNP actually got 45% of the vote, albeit the turnout was lower. <coughs> My question really is um, we've seen it before, the SNP vote being remarkably strong from their peak which they've never surpassed so far, of 11 seats at Westminster in October 74, down to two in 79, was a collapse. 
Um, and just your, your views on how soft the SNP vote is, um, I would introduce the word oil at this stage, actually, because obviously it's not part of the SNP scenario but the collapse of the oil price. It's not just hit the northeast of my native Aberdeen, but it's undermined uh, one of the central arguments of the SNP in terms of uh, the economic position in Scotland. The second point is really that how much you think PR in local government, we had a word about this before, but I think it's very interesting that PR, the introduction of PR in local, local government basically shook up, as we say in Scotland, Scottish politics. It allowed the SNP to get into parts of Scotland that it had not done so before, where Labour would just control all the council seats. Um, it would be very interesting indeed, and I think the Liberal Democrats probably regret they didn't actually make that condition of the last coalition of introducing PR in England, which would also shake up probably politics here. <laughs> Gosh, there's a lot in there. Um, is is the it SNP, reasonably short, so we yeah, get a couple of Is it soft? Don't know. Um, the, um, what, the electorate, what we know about the electorate is that they're quite clever uh, and they understand the purpose of different elections. So in 2010, uh, Labour swept the pool uh, at the UK general election in Scotland. And the SNP were nowhere. Labour did really well. Uh, all the opinion polling thereafter said that therefore Labour would do very well uh, in the 2011 Scottish elections and they got gubbed. And that is because uh, the voters understood these were different elections. Uh, we were very happy to say we want a Labour government in Westminster, uh, but no, I said, I don't really want them in Holyrood, thank you very much. Entirely rational set of choices. Interesting question, uh, is what we're seeing today's opinion polls, people still mentally thinking about the referendum? And when they finally focus in the last six weeks or so in the general election, they say, well, actually, this is really about Labour or the Tory. We don't know that. It might not be like 2010, or it might be. Very, very hard to tell. Um, as for oil, um, uh, the collapse in the oil price has been extraordinary. The collapse in the oil revenues has been even bigger than the collapse in the oil price. Uh, the fiscal position of an independent Scotland was very parlous, even uh, with oil where the SNP claimed it would be, which is well above what it actually was. It's now very, very difficult uh, indeed uh, with oil. I mean, uh, and the fiscal position of an independent Scotland is roughly the same is the fiscal position of a Devo Max Scotland. So say Scotland would send a cheque once a year to Westminster to pay for the army and whatever share it had of the national debt, whatever residual common services there were, probably on a per capita basis, that's the only way you could calculate it. The result would be a cut in domestic Scottish public spending or increase in domestic Scottish taxes of between 10 and 15%. Oof, that's Osborne over again and a bit more. So very, very tough. Um, as for PR, well, um, uh, it was supposed to shake it up. Yes, it certainly shook up the whole government. It's rather like um, the old, those of you, the older members of the audience will remember when you could hit the top of a television in the hope of getting a better picture. Uh, well, we hit the top of local government and the picture's still pretty shaky. Right, to the back there, yep. Yeah. Um, you spoke about the wealth gap between yes and no voters. Um, and you also talked about the conditions in which the referendum took place, i.e. after a session with low living standards. Um, and from those two points, um, does that mean that you kind of agree, agree entirely with the kind of Gordon Brown thesis that support for the Yes campaign was driven by kind of um, a national feeling that Scotland was in decline because of economic conditions? And secondly, you talk, with regards to the wealth gap, does that mean that you think that in some way the referendum was almost a proxy referendum on a kind of more socialist Scotland? Um, I don't think Gordon's analysis would be that the referendum was primarily about Scotland being in decline or not. But I certainly think that for uh, many voters, um, so, uh, what you might call non-traditional independent supporters, who might be an SNP voters in the Scottish elections, but weren't supporters of independence, uh, my feeling is that they were as much voting against what was happening as for something else. Uh, and one sees, I mean, all across Europe, folk are voting against stuff. Uh, the difference is that in Scotland they have a movement, a political party, respectable. Uh, you know, it's in government. Uh, 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 it's demonstrated uh, capability of doing stuff. The interesting question for me, and I, we don't know the answer to this, is whether there's a kind of hysteresis effect in this. Uh, whether having got themselves into the place of saying, 
independence is the answer to all these questions, they'll stick with that. Or, or whether, as the world moves on, maybe hopefully the economy gets a little better, uh, maybe um, as a change in UK policy and austerity isn't quite so ghastly if that were to happen, uh, maybe their views would change. That is in the lap of the gods. don't know the answer to that. <coughs> um, actually you talked about the, the voting patterns between age and the referendum, um, but you didn't particularly reflect on the impact of lowering the voting age to 16. Um, now, as far as I'm aware, this is one of the only examples in recent history where <coughs> for a 16-year-old in Scotland, they were, given, they were given the trust to vote on the independence referendum, and then less than a year have, later, they were given the trust to vote in a general election. And so I was wondering what impact do you think that experience will have, both on young people turning perhaps towards nationalism and on a kind of a general push towards lowering the voting age? Um, the, the evidence is that the uh, 16 to 21 year olds were more or less the same as the general population. Um, they sort of tw I'm going from memory, uh, people in their mid-twenties were a bit more pro-independence. Uh, Crumblies were very anti-independence. Uh, so. Um, I don't think the 16 to 18 year olds made a huge difference one way or another. Um, it, but from my own experience, the engagement of youngsters in the referendum was great fun. Um, will it stick? I don't know, um, because this was such an unusual, such a, a unique event. This was, what it shows you is that if people think voting makes a difference, they'll vote. Um, now, can we persuade them that voting in the general election makes a difference? Well, since you and I can't, you know, between us, figure out what on earth the result will mean maybe, maybe we won't be able to. OK, we'll take one more, one more turn at the back here, and then we need to uh, stop. So can this be, have to be a very short question and a very short answer so we don't overrun. Do you think that sort of increasing support for the NSP is actually going to increase Labour's chances of uh, being in government after the next elections or decrease it? Decrease. <laughs> That's the short answer. Manifestly. Um, the, I mean, if the SNP get lots of seats in Scotland after the general election, the probability of Labour being the largest party reduces. The largest party gets first dibs at being government. So, um, you know, the argument, uh, you know, vote SNP uh, because they will be beside Labour anyway, uh, fails to understand the mechanics of coalition formation. Uh, whoever's the biggest party uh, will be in the driving seat. Uh, if the SNP do well, Labour will not be the biggest party. OK, I'm sorry for those of you. You can run down. We, we need to finish on time. Um, before we uh, just finish, Anish, are any of you who uh, would like to listen to more about uh, general elections, there's an event going on in the Wolfson Theatre, about to start now on past British general elections, with uh, Professor Vernon Bogdanor, Sir David Butler and Sir Robert Worcester. I'd like to go across to that. It's literally in the Wolfson just across the way. Other than that, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Professor Gallagher once again. Thank you very much, Jim.